Is anyone, first question, is anyone hot in this room? And I don't mean the way you look, I'm just saying the way you feel. Um, are, are, if you feel hot, um, if, you, if you feel hot, um, I think, is anyone cold? I think we should, uh, ushers, um, I, I think we should close the windows and turn the air conditioning on. I know it's a big five bucks that we're losing out of the budget, but I think we've got to do that. So why don't we close these things, just because I don't want people falling asleep during my sermon, which never happens otherwise, but I don't want that to happen. Um, thank you. And then turn the air conditioning on if you can. All right, well, everyone else, would you please turn to John chapter 9 in your Bibles? And let's start in prayer. The Lord be with you. Father, I thank you for um, this opportunity that we have to come and and worship you, especially on a day um, like this. Many people have lost many things um, in the last week. Lord, I pray that you will use this time to direct all our hearts and minds to one who cannot be shaken and one who cannot be lost. And I pray that you will use my words and um, the things that I say um, to move us all uh, to your son, Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Okay. um, the lectionary calls for us to talk about forgiveness today, which would have been great because we all need to hear that, but um, I'm going to let you hold on to your grudges for another week um, because I changed, I changed the lectionary on purpose because of what happened this week and the flood, um, and I wanted to talk about, about that a little bit. I've had a, several conversations this week, mostly with people who have lost things in the flood, um, either... Uh, their home, part of their home, or possession, even animals and pets. I don't know if you read the paper this morning um, about Petco and all the, the pets that died in the flood. And that was a really, really sad and, and terrible story. Um, one person I talked to was a prisoner who said, you know, it's hard not to be mad at God right now. It's very difficult not to be angry with him. He said, I know lots of people who are just now, just in these last, this last year, getting over the last flood. And God allows this one to take place. It's true. I think I read 20,000 people were evacuated. Um, who knows how many of those people actually lost homes? Don't know. Um, who knows how many businesses were affected and destroyed? We, we don't know yet, but a lot. Who knows if many people who lost their home are going to say, hey, you know what, we've had a 100-year flood in the last twice in the last five years, so I'm just going somewhere else, and I'm going to move out of Binghamton. I know a lot of people are afraid that their um, workplaces are going to make the same decision, and it'll be without a job. Binghamton uh, was already in economically poor shape, and I think spiritually, just from my experience being in Binghamton, it's kind of a spiritually depressed area, and uh, this has not helped. In fact, it has hurt us pretty badly, very badly. So here are some questions I think we need to wrestle with and talk about today. Three of them. First one is, why did God let this happen? Very simple. Why did God let this happen? Second is, does God have a purpose for Binghamton in this flood? Third, and how should Good Shepherd respond? Three questions. We'll spend most of our time in the first one, but then we'll get to the second two um, in good order. All right, you might notice an assumption in this first question, which is, why did God let this happen? The same question, if you were around, um, was asked after the tsunami that hit Japan this year, remember, or 2010, or two, I can't remember if it was this year or not. And the same question, since today is the day, the same question was asked in the aftermath of the September 11 attacks. Why did God let this happen? The assumption there is that God could have stopped it. And there could be no terrorist attack, and there could be no tsunami, and there could be no flood in Binghamton unless God permitted it. 
Now, when I was an atheist and agnostic, I'm not now, just in case you're wondering. Uh, when I was an atheist and an agnostic, I used to say to questions like that, give me a break. The Susquehanna flooded because an already rain-saturated region was, got slammed by a tropical storm, causing rivers and streams to overflow. And the tropical storm hit this particular region because winds, uh, barometric pressure, and various weather patterns brought it. Why bring God into the question at all? But knowing how a thing happens is not necessarily to know everything about why a thing happens. A good architectural engineer, and we have some engineers here today studying a skyscraper, can trace the process by which it was built, identifying step by step what happened first, second, and third. He can tell how the foundation was laid and the steel set in place and show how each successive floor was built on top of the other. But knowing these facts does not lead to the conclusion, I hope, that the foundation laid itself or that the floors stacked themselves, one on top of the other. There's obviously a mind and a hand and a will beyond the observable facts of how the skyscraper came to be what it is. Now, in the same way, wow, can someone fix, can you fix that feedback, Chris? In the same way, God, and you can ignore them, just look at me. Um, in the same way, God invites you and me in Scripture to recognize his hand in all the works of nature. All the works of nature. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. God speaks. God reveals Himself in creation. And not just creation in the beginning. God didn't just kick the football and let it go, right? Hebrews tells us this. He, Christ, upholds the universe by his word of power, right? So what that means is if he stopped speaking this word, if he stopped holding us into being, if he decided at one moment to stop his activity now in the created order, we would cease to be. We would come undone immediately. His power and might and glory is in every flood, every earthquake, every hurricane, every gust of wind that lightly brushes your cheek. And so the question, why did God let this happen, is quite appropriate. Years ago, a Reformed rabbi, not Reformed in the Christian sense, but Reformed in the Jewish sense, Rabbi Harold Kushner, or Kushner sought to defend God in the face of such tragedy by suggesting that while God created and designed the natural world, he doesn't have the power to stop what takes place within the natural world. He designed it to operate on its own, and he equipped you and me, he equipped us with Ingenuity, so that we might use our minds and our hands and our brains um, to protect ourselves against floods and famine. We are here, said Rabbi Kushner, to be God's hands on the earth, creating a clean, harmonious, and safe environment. And therefore, tragedy and disaster, when it strikes, have nothing to do with God and everything to do with us. That's a tempting idea, right? It gets God totally off the hook, doesn't it? Right? It's our fault, right? We're, we're misusing the environment or something, and so that's why this flood came. It's a, we need to do something about us and change us, and that will change um, the way nature works. And then God's up there as the friendly God, innocent. No problem. 
But the God who creates and then stands powerless over his creation is not the God revealed in Scripture. Here in the Bible, God is intimately involved in every event on earth. And not only involved, he is sovereign over it. His hand compels the generation of stars in the furthest reaches of the universe and the mutation of the tiniest cell in your body. Jesus asks rhetorically, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And of course, the question, uh, the answer is yes. And then he says, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. If no sparrow falls to the ground apart from God's will or permission, how much more two towers that touch the sky? How much more are we to recognize his hand in earthquakes and hurricanes and floods? So again, the question. And I hope you see the reason for it now. Why did God let this happen? Because that is a truth. God let this happen. It's the question of one who takes her Bible seriously. But it's also a question we must answer with extreme caution. Soon after 9-11, Jerry Falwell, who's heard of Jerry Falwell? He's now passed. He's gone to be with his uh, maker. And he said that the attack, if you've heard this, nod your head. He said the attack represented God's judgment on America for legalizing abortion. You hear this? After the 2005 tsunami in Thailand and Southeast Asia, uh, some prominent preachers said that God sent the tsunami because of child prostitution and the sex trade that was going on there. Now, abortion and the sex trade are indeed terrible evils. They are a stench in God's nostrils. God hates both of them because he loves infinitely those who are destroyed by them. That's why he hates them. And it is true, we saw the aftermath of it in our first reading today, it is true that the Bible reveals God sending disaster sometimes to punish corporate sin. That, that's happened. He caused the flood in Noah's day, and this is from Genesis 6, verse 5, because the Lord saw that every intention of the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. But there have been many floods. God spoke about one of them. To claim that 9-11 or the tsunami or this flood is divine punishment is to claim that God spoke to you or speaks to you like he did to Noah and the prophets. Jerry Falwell may have been a swell guy, but a prophet he was not. God only speaks to us that clearly in the Bible. And I don't know how many of you have read your Bible all the way through. I have. I've done it several times now. I would brag, but I won't get my reward in heaven and tell you how many times. I've read it several times, and I can tell you very clearly there is nothing in there about an attack on New York City. I don't care what anybody tells you. (laughs) There is nothing in there about an attack on New York City. There is nothing in there about tsunamis in Thailand. And there is nothing about floods in Broome County. It's just not there. So why did God allow this flood at this time? The only answer you can give anybody who asks you that question, and the only answer I can give anyone who asks that question is, I don't know. I don't know. God hasn't told me. He may not tell me until I get to heaven. Not all that satisfying, is it? Well, then comes the second question, which I think might help. The second question is, 
does God have a purpose for Binghamton in this? And I want in our minds um, for us to go back to Genesis 1 and 2. You don't have to turn there. Just go back in your mind. Again, you don't have to go there because I'm not going to reference anything specifically. But you can look at it if you want to. If it will make you feel um, better, that's great. Um, whether there were floods and earthquakes in the garden. Remember, Genesis 1 and 2 is before the fall. is before sin entered the world. Whether there were floods and earthquakes in the garden, I don't know. If you read, like some theologians actually argue about that. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to tell you that right now. I don't want to get into that. Um, I don't know. Um, but if there were floods and hurricanes and earthquakes in the garden, I can tell you one thing for sure. No harm came to Adam or Eve or any beast in that garden. When humanity walked with God, death, destruction, and terror did not exist for us. But when Adam chose to be his own man, and Eve too, and make their own way and be their own gods, he also chose at that moment to remove himself, and she chose to remove herself from the Father's protective hand. And like the father of the prodigal son, if you remember that story, in love, God let Adam and Eve take their inheritance and make their way in the world. And as did Adam, so do we. We are born in Adam's path and follow his footsteps. That's the world. And though it grieves God, he does not force us to turn back. He lets us live in the pigsty and experience the consequences of the choice that we have made to leave our Father's house. And so there is, for all of us, good or bad, well, none of us are really good, but better and worse, Um, for all of us, there is death. For all of us, there is disease. For all of us, there is sickness. There's floods, there are earthquakes, there are hurricanes. All of these things come as the general, general consequence for our having rejected God. Now, when asked about a terrible tragedy in his day, Jesus refused to link it to a particular sin on the part of the victims of that particular tragedy. Instead, he asks this. He said, he's listening to this question. Do you think that these people, the victims, are worse than others because they suffered in this way? In other words, do you think God singled out the people who suffered? This is a big tower in a place called Siloam fell on them. Do you think God picked them out to suffer worse than anyone else because they're worse than you are? No, he says, which would be great. If you just stopped there, I would love it. But he goes on and he says, but unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Did you hear that? Yeah, I mean, this wasn't particular punishment for their sin, but you know what you see happen to them? Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you hear his point? This tragedy didn't happen because these particular guys were sinners, but because we're not in the garden anymore, we're all very far gone from the Father's house and from his roof. Therefore, when these things take place, that is your call to turn back, to turn around, to repent, go home. To the Father who loves you. I don't know why God allowed this particular flood at this particular time, but I do know that this flood reveals that we have left the garden. We're not there anymore. 
God's purpose in allowing this flood and every flood then is at least partly to call us home, to turn back. For those who've lost everything and for those who've lost nothing, now is the time to consider your life. Consider your life. Sometimes by stripping everything away, God reveals that only one thing is necessary. He sometimes lays us flat on our backs so that for once in our life we're looking in the right direction. He does that. If you have been looking in other directions and serving other gods, now, today, is the day to repent. If you've been living a life apart from God, apart from His Son, Jesus Christ, today is the day to take what happened this week, see it as a warning, and say, no, I am going to go back to my Father's house through Jesus Christ. If you've lost nothing this week, The fact is, you will one day lose everything. You're going to die someday. Did you know that? I am too. So you might as well give everything to Jesus now because he's going to take it anyway. Jesus promises to forgive you, to embrace you, to pick you up and take you back to your father's home. He will do that. He will do that. Go to him. There is another purpose as well, and we're winding down now. Don't worry. When Jesus met a man born blind, and this is where your Bible should be open, he was asked a very similar question. So who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, Jesus, being a pretty logical guy, being God incarnate, um, recognized this as a false dichotomy, a false choice, a choice between two alternatives, and when there's actually a third alternative out there that, um, that they weren't considering. The man's blindness, which was a tragedy for his parents, says Jesus, was not punishment against him or against his parents, rather it was, quote, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then he goes on to say, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming when no one can work. God had a great purpose hidden in this man's unseeing eyes. And that purpose is this. He spit on the ground made mud with the saliva, and then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Then he went and washed and came back seeing. So let me summarize what happened here. God allowed the consequences, the general consequences of human sin, which are, you know, death, disease, blindness, all that kind of stuff, that comes from the fact that we're a world outside the Father's house. God allowed the general consequences of human sin to affect this man in particular so that He could display his love for those who live in darkness and bring glory to his son, Jesus Christ. God allowed the consequences of human sin to affect this man in particular so that he could display his love and show people the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. Far, far from a punishment, this man's blindness was a means through which Jesus revealed to him the God who gives sight to the blind, the Savior who brings freedom to those held in bondage by sin and to the God-man who brings life out of death. 
Now, let me suggest to you, and it's not really a suggestion because it's in the Bible, which means it's a truth. Let me suggest to you that there is in every tragedy and crisis not only the call to repent and turn to God, but there is a call as followers of Jesus to work the works of Christ while it is day. To bring those who live in darkness um, to see the light, to reveal God's mercy, God's kindness, God's truth, and God's glory in what we do and in what we say. Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me. He's talking about the Father while it is day. The we is in us. You, me, Jesus. The day is now. When Christ returns, it will be night for those who refuse to see him or for those who die before he gets back. So in the day, we go with Jesus into the dark places of the world to the people who suffer, spiritually suffer because they're alienated from God or physically suffer because their homes have been destroyed. We do the works he's called us to do. We feed, we clothe, we give shelter. We pour ourselves out. And we don't do this like social workers. I like social workers. They're great. Don't mean to, if you're a social worker, wonderful. I love you. Great. Um, we don't do it like social workers, however, because we do all these things in Jesus' name for his glory. So this week, people did come and find shelter here. They did come and find food here. And so when they asked me, and some of them did, why are you doing this? I didn't say, well, I just like to help people. I'm a great guy like that, you know? I'm really generous. I'm a really good, good, good person. Because what does that do? Who does that, who does that bring glory to? So instead, I got to say, well, you know what? I'm only doing this because Jesus loves you and he told me to do it. Jesus loves you very much. And he wants you to be fed and have clothes and be in this church. When people ask us what we do as we serve and go out into the world and alleviate suffering, we, we say this is what Jesus calls us to do. He loves you and he wants me to help you. So those are the two purposes here. God's purpose for Binghamton in this flood is very clear. To call all men and women back home through Jesus Christ. That's one. And two, to reveal his son in the words and the works of his followers who alleviate suffering. That's it. Those two things. All right, finally, last thing, and then we'll close up. How is Good Shepherd, this is very practical, how is Good Shepherd to play a part in this overall purpose of God? And if you drove here this morning or you were looking out your window, I hope you were if you were driving, you would have seen um, the sign that said uh, food, meals, shelter, right? That's one thing that we've done very practically. We've opened the church up. It's probably going to be open for another week at least. Um, I know we've had a dwindling number of people here. You had five the first night, three the second night, then two. It, who knows? But I think when people go back, see their homes are wrecked, they might want a place to stay. So we're just going to keep it open for the rest of the week, and if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We've been providing meals, uh, lunch, and dinner every day, and uh, on Friday, breakfast, because the men make it. So um, that's going to go on at least for this next week, maybe longer. We'll see how what the need is. We'll keep going. Um, that's all very good and well, and if you've helped in that effort, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thanks be to God in you. That's great. Um, Now, in the coming days and months, this is what I want from you. Not me. I'm sorry. This is what Jesus wants from you. And I can tell you that he does. I'm not just making this up. Jesus didn't tell me this audibly, but he tells me this in the Bible, all right? He wants your sweat. He doesn't want to collect your sweat. He wants you to sweat. (laughs) He wants you to work. If you are able, if you have a body, if you have a young or well-proportioned body, you're able to get out and work, he wants your effort, right? So... There are lots and lots and lots of homes that have been destroyed. Um, In the next week, I'm going to find a way that we can coordinate with Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and other teams that are going to go in and help clean. If you would like to be part of that, I want you to sign your name on a piece of paper that I'm going to have downstairs after this service to help do that. There are uh, at least, again, I said before, three people in this church or three families that have lost 
made to have significant loss to their home and property. And we will also, I think that's going to be our first focus effort right there is helping those three homes out. Um, and so what's going to happen the next week, and now if you want to do this, you sign your name, your address, or excuse me, your name, your email address, and your phone number, I will call you. We will probably gather here tomorrow. I, don't, I, I can't be sure about that because we have to wait until the assessment teams go through all the affected areas and say whether we can go back in or not. Um, but when that is done, um, we will gather here and form teams, and we will go where we're needed. All right? um, so I, I'm, I'm asking you to work. I'm asking you for your sweat, for your time, and for your effort. Now, if you're working at work, I understand you can't do that, but if you're not, um, you can. Um, second thing I'm going to ask for is your money. Got very silent. I'm going to ask you for <laughs> I'm going to ask you for your money because we are going to set aside a fund at some point. I haven't talked to the vestry about this yet, but I'm sure they'll agree. We're going to set aside a fund, um, and you can put money in that, and we will use that directly to aid those who um, have been affected by this. Uh, last thing you can do, of course, is pray. All right? um, this is not just a, a material thing. This is a spiritual thing. People have lost things that they care about and love, so um, we pray that they, in this loss, are able to grasp um, Jesus and that God will recover those things they've lost. So um, let's pray now, and then we'll close. The Lord be with you. Father, you are the God of all the cosmos. Um, There is not a gust of wind. There is not a hurricane. Um, There is not a tornado or a flood that takes place apart from your will. Um, Lord, this does show forth your power and your glory in all the world. Lord, I pray that, um, that the church, not just our church, but the church in Binghamton, Um, that you will give us your grace um, to point people in this time and in this day to your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for anyone here who needs to turn around. Lord, open their eyes so they can see, soften their hearts so they can hear. Lord, give them the grace to believe and to trust your son, Jesus. Finally, Father, I pray for us as a church that you will give us a spirit of generosity and sacrifice during this time. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.